Well, hello and welcome back. Today we're examining the thought of the German theologian, Jürgen Moltmann. And there's no doubt that Moltmann's theology of the Trinity and theology of God has been one of the most influential theologies of the 20th century. Just to think certain words bring attention to Jürgen Moltmann. The word perichoresis in the Western tradition is widely used because of Jürgen Moltmann. The term panentheism is very much one associated with Jürgen Moltmann. The suffering of God and the passibility of God is associated with him. Social Trinitarianism often is associated with Jürgen Moltmann. And Moltmann has a very interesting understanding of God's lordship. That is also God's freedom. That is also God's love. And so we're going to unpack those concepts today. Now, I'm going to be using mainly two books, The Crucified God, an early work from 1972 from Moltmann, where he focuses in on the Christ crucified event, that event of the cross, and he looks carefully at the Trinitarian relations that happen in that Christ event. And then we'll take a look at a more developed Trinitarian theology, the Trinity and the Kingdom of God from 1981, where Moltmann thinks more deeply on his social Trinitarianism and really brings out social Trinitarianism as a Trinitarian model. We start then with the Crucified God from 1972. In this work, Moltmann is examining a theology of the cross and he asks a critical question. He asks, what did the event of the crucifixion mean for the life of God? And his answer is rather startling. It changes God to be something different. Now, Moltmann understands that God exists as a triunity of love. God is love, 1 John chapter 4. And God then constitutes his existence in the event of his love. So God enters into our history and he becomes who he is in love as he acts in love. In the cross, father and son are the most deeply separated in forsakenness. And at the same time, they're most inwardly one in their surrender. So there's a paradox going on in this event where father turns his back on the son, the son dies, the persons of the Trinity themselves are suffering. And yet in that, they are in the fullest moment of love toward one another and so most fully unified. Moltmann describes this in dramatic terms, God against God. The cross stands between the Father and the Son in all harshness of its forsakenness. And Moltmann says if one describes the life of God within the Trinity as the history of God, following Hegel here, this history of God contains within itself the whole abyss of God's forsakenness, absolute death, and the non-God. So Moltmann thinks that in this crucifixion event, God takes within himself God forsakenness, absolute death, and the non-God. And all of that is drawn into God himself because God makes room for that within himself. And that drama on the cross is a drama of Trinitarian persons. So Moltmann will say, the God the Father suffers the death of the Son. And Moltmann will also say that the father then loses his fatherhood or the father suffers the death of his fatherhood because the son dies. God, the son, suffers dying. And, of course, Moltmann understands that it's the person Jesus Christ who dies on the cross. It's not the eternal trinity that somehow one of them suddenly dies, but but. Because this individual, God the Son, united to a human being, faces death and accepts it, something really happens in the life of God. Now, the father then is experiencing the loss of his fatherhood because the son dies. And the son is experiencing death because he is dying in Jesus Christ. God the Spirit then is working to join father and son in a community of wills, 
Remember, with Augustine's view of the Trinity, God is the beloved, is the lover who loves the beloved, the Son, and the bond of love is the Holy Spirit. And Moltmann takes that here and he understands the Spirit's work in this crucifixion event to be that of joining a community of wills. And the Spirit then proceeds or spills over from that event to justify the godless and to fill the forsaken with love. And so the Spirit's love that comes out of this event spills out into the world and makes this event effective. Now, Moltmann understands fully that most of the Christian tradition has seen God as impassable and immutable. God does not suffer in himself and God does not change in himself. And most of the tradition has then made a strong distinction between the imminent trinity, who God is in God's self, and the economic trinity, how God acts in the world. Moltmann wants to bridge that gap as he sees it between the imminent and economic trinity. And in this early book, he pretty much destroys that gap. The economic trinity is the imminent trinity, and the imminent trinity is the economic trinity, he says, quoting Rahner, and he doesn't see any real distinction between the two. So he emphasizes God suffers. A God who cannot suffer cannot love either. Only that which suffers is divine, he says. Suffering is the mark of goodness, and so one who cannot suffer is not as good as one who can. And one who actually suffers, then, is, only, is one who is capable of being the divine. A God who cannot suffer is poorer than any man. But the one who cannot suffer cannot love either. So love and suffering are very closely aligned with Moltmann. To be able to love is to be able to suffer, and to actually love is to actually suffer, Moltmann thinks. So that kind of a god would be a loveless being if he could not be a suffering being. Now, Moltmann thinks that the Western Church has pressed too much attention into the imminent trinity. And the reason that it's done that is that it's moved Trinitarian theology from being a reflection on soteriology, how God acts in our world to save us, and has moved it into a realm of abstract speculation, of metaphysics. And so the discipline of Trinitarian theology becomes very abstract. And when that's the case, theologians then feel free to pin attributes like immutability and impassibility on God, when in reality, the doctrine of the Trinity was intended to show the pattern of soteriology, and therefore it should be associated with God coming and really suffering in our world. Moltmann makes a key distinction here. He's going to call this, paradoxically, active suffering by God. Now, the very word to suffer, passio, seems to require a bit of passivity, but Moltmann wants to make this an active suffering. It was God's choice to suffer. God has always chosen to be with us and therefore to suffer. Now, what many theologians see at this point is something of a collapsing of the imminent trinity into the economic trinity, so that God is bound by the things that he does in creation, so that God must create and must suffer with and must become over the course of time, and therefore God needs creation in order for his existence to be complete. And this would be the main concern of someone like Karl Barth. For Karl Barth, God has absolute freedom, and that means that God can do anything that God wants. God is self-determinate being, but God has free choice. God could create, or could God may not create. It depends on what he wishes. But once God creates, and once he has elected, and that elective decree has been set, then God is set for all eternity to follow that elective decree because he has bound himself to that elective decree. Now, for Bart, this is very important because that keeps grace being grace. If God simply had to create in order to be himself, then it wouldn't be a gracious act to create. 
And if God had to save us in order to come into his full existence, then salvation wouldn't be gracious. It would be necessity. And so Barton understands that freedom, then, must mean the freedom for God to choose to create or not to create. Now, Moltmann will criticize Barton at exactly this point. Because for Moltmann, it sounds like Bart has a God with two natures. There was a God that at one point in eternity past could have chosen anything. And then once God has chosen that, then God is bound, kind of a second nature, to the decision that he's made. Moltmann thinks that Bart privileges freedom over love. And Moltmann wants to change that order and privilege love over freedom. So, Moltmann's understanding of freedom is this. Freedom is self-communication of the good. And you can't say that that happens by compulsion, and you can't say it happens arbitrarily. Rather, it's the inner pleasure of God's eternal love that makes him free. That means that he will communicate himself outwardly into creation. God will create because of the inner impulse of God's love. And so, Moltmann will understand God's lordship not as God's ability to do anything and God's sovereignty over everything, but rather, for Moltmann, God's lordship is understood as God's freedom in friendship or in fellowship. Moltmann, then, will thoroughly embrace the idea that God has to create, that God has eternally set himself to create. And Moltmann will do it by claiming the term pantheism. That is, that God makes room in God's self for creation. God has always made room in God's self for what is not exactly God. Because God is who he is, it could not have been otherwise. Creation has to be. Now, Moltmann will distinguish panentheism, his perspective, from what he calls theism, and read Karl Barth here, and pantheism, which is God in everything. Let's understand these two. Pantheism is the idea that God must create, but God creates by way of emanations. That is, it's necessary of the very nature of his being that creation will flow from him. Moltmann doesn't want to say quite that, but he also doesn't want to go in the realm of what he calls theism, and that is, reading Karl Barth here, that God could have not created, that creation is an external act of God's, Moltmann says, arbitrary will, in which God simply says, okay, I decide I'll create even though I'm perfect without creation, and it's a gracious choice by God, no doubt, but Moltmann sees arbitrariness in that. So he wants to tie creation closer to God, say that creation always belongs to the essence of God as the self-communication of the good. And God makes room in God's self for creation and will be with creation, will work with creation in suffering until creation is perfected in himself. Moltmann wants then to emphasize as vividly as possible the real relationship that God has with his creation, namely with us. And Moltmann, to do that, wants to emphasize the role that the individual persons play in the economy of salvation because, he says, that affects the way that God is in himself, in the imminent trinity. And so he will talk about social trinitarianism. Now, to understand social trinitarianism, we have to step back and see what Moltmann is rejecting. And that is a Western conception, as he sees it, that focuses on the one God, that focuses almost cl too close to modalism that always is focused on monarchianism or on the lordship of one. And the individual persons end up being only an afterthought after that one God is discussed. Moltmann will call this monotheistic monarchianism. That's his term. Or he'll call it Christian monotheism. That's Barth's term. And Moltmann is writing against Barth here. Now, what Moltmann sees in the history of Western Christianity, 
a bit overplayed perhaps, is always an emphasis on the one instead of the three persons. He goes clear back to Tertullian, and Tertullian has established this word substantia to talk about God. There is one substance in God, and Moton sees coming out of that quite naturally the Sabellian heresy focused on modalism, that God is one God in three different modes of being, or Arianism that focuses on one God alone and so sees Jesus as not being fully God. And then he traces this through history and he sees uh, in Augustine and Aquinas the psychological and analogy of the Trinity being developed. That is, that we can understand the triune persons best by understanding the operation of our own mind. And in one mind, there is an intellectual movement and there is a movement of the will. And so that describes the tri-personal nature of God. Maltman takes this one step further with idealism, and he thinks that both Bart and Rahner, those two key Trinitarian theologians of the 20th century, have been influenced too much by idealism. So, Son and Spirit are, we could say, maybe manifestations in history of the one God, and for Moltmann, this has real political effects in the West. He sees all the way through Western pol uh, political thought something that's close to Christian monotheism. All the way going back to Constantine, we have one sovereign leader under God. And he traces this all the way through medieval Europe. The French Calvinists continued this idea of one leader, and that leader is a step under God, and then leads people who are a further step under God. And the idea of lordship is seen as sovereignty. Now, clearly, Moltmann is going to want to destroy that Western concept of lordship as sovereignty politically, and so he looks for a different Trinitarian way of doing this in the so social Trinitarianism. Probably the best definition of persons in Moltmann's social Trinitarian model comes from the Trinity and the Kingdom, page 171. Persons are individual, unique, non-interchangeable subjects of the one common divine essence, each with consciousness and each with will. Each of the persons possess the divine nature in a non-interchangeable way. Each presents it in its own way. So each of the persons then is going to have their own mind, their own will, their own subjectivity, and each will possess the divine nature in a non-interchangeable way that is not like the others and will express it, economically probably, in a non-interchangeable way. That's the definition. Let's see how Moltmann gets there. He goes through five steps as I see it, the later ones being the most important. The first step, he takes a medieval understanding of person as an individual substance with a rational nature. Moltmann is saying a person is not a mode of being. A person is one that has full subjectivity. It's an individual substance with a rational nature. Now, of course, that's not going to work very well for a divine person, so he goes a little further. Persons are constituted, step two, in relationships with others. And here he draws on Augustine. Paternity and filiation and spiration, these are names that suggest relationship. And Moltmann likes that part of the, of the Western heritage. But he goes a step further using Richard of St. Victor. Persons exist in ecstatic love for others. So persons are always persons in act in the Trinity. And those persons in act are always acting in the fullness of love. That's what it means that God is love. So by virtue of the love they have for one another, they exist totally in the other. Each person finds its existence and joy in the other person, and each person receives the fullness of eternal life from the other. There's a sharing of life, a giving of life, a receiving of life, mutually indwelling one another. That leads us towards step four and five. Step four, he draws off of Hegel here to make this claim that persons become 
historically. Persons are in the process of becoming persons. As a person realize their personhood through reciprocal acts of self-giving and receiving. Now the divine persons have existed as three persons from all eternity. Uh, Moltmann will affirm that. But they are becoming into their fullest relational realities as they relate to each other and as they relate to creation. That leads us to the most important step, step five, perichoresis. The use of this term is going to be very important for Moltmann. What he means by perichoresis is this mutual indwelling. So all of the persons share in the divine nature. They are indwelling each other in this divine nature. They are sharing to, with each other the divine nature. And therefore, they exist as three persons in one trinity. Now, perichoresis is going to do a lot for Moltmann, and so it's worth stepping back and seeing exactly what this term means. Perichoresis it means a dynamic mutual indwelling. It's often thought of as a dance, an active being in the other. John 17 would be a good example. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. I pray to the Father as I am in you, and you in me. So I share that with the disciples, Jesus says. They may be in me as I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And so there's a perichoretic relationship, a mutual indwelling, a, a dance of love, one might say. Now, once we understand perichoresis, Moltmann thinks, we'll understand much better what the call of the Christian is supposed to be. Because if God's very nature is to exist as three persons mutually indwelling one another, existing in perfect love and perfect harmony and perfect equality with one another, then that ought to give us a pattern for the Christian life. So, for Moltmann, human beings consummate their messianic identity as, as the image of God when they are free in love and when they become those who free in love. So, the activity of the Christian is to be free in love by loving freely and to free others in love by loving freely. Notice then that equality and love and restoration, these are the activities that the triune persons do. And so they ought to be the fundamental activities that constitute us in our image of God and that help us to become what we were intended to be in the image of God. Now, all of this sounds really good, and there's much to be learned from every part of what Moltmann is saying here. But but I have a few questions for Moltmann. First, is it really possible on Moltmann's account to unite the persons of the Trinity? After all, Moltmann has stepped back from talking about essence and he wants to emphasize the threefold nature of the persons. But notice what he denies. He denies that they have one mind and one will and one consciousness. They are three centers of consciousness each with its own mind, each with its own will. The tradition has never been willing to go in that direction because then it looks as if there are three gods. Tritheism becomes a real possibility. Always the tradition has emphasized that there is one will and one intellect in God that apply to all persons. Furthermore, Moltmann rejects mutually inseparable operations. He says each of the persons are constituted by doing their own thing. But the tradition, once again, has always emphasized mutually inseparable operations as a way of showing that where one of the Trinity is, there are the others doing the same thing. And so perichoresis works in the tradition precisely because all of the persons of the Trinity are together doing what one of the Trinity is doing. Moltmann denies that in order to emphasize their differences. And so it's not quite clear if his term perichoresis can handle the weight he's putting on it. Second, I would wonder, is it really possible for God to suffer and for God to become? How does God contain within himself the whole abyss of God forsakenness, absolute death, and non-God? I don't quite understand what that kind of statement would mean. And if God is becoming, then who was God 
from history past before he became the perfect being that God is going to be. Third question, is Moltmann's God actually a free God? And it's not entirely clear that this God is free. Because for Moltmann, God always had to create of his very nature. And if God is not free then in that act, because that act had to happen, then it's not clear that grace is still grace, because God was, in a sense, obligated to create and obligated to work in salvation history. One might prefer Bart's categories here of freedom to not create. Finally, we might ask, is perichoresis really a valuable biblical word or is it projectionism? Karen Kilby says that Moltmann starts out by using the term perichoresis in order to fix a problem. How is it that the triune persons are joined together? And then when he uses that word, but how does he know what it means? Well, only if we look around in our society and we see what good kinds of relationships are like. And so for Moltmann, then, he will take from society the kinds of relationships that seem ideal to him. So Moltmann will then say, perichoresis must be this way. And there seems to be a circularity in this argument. We find this when Moltmann is emphasizing certain types of societies certain democratic types of societies, certain egalitarian types of societies, and he's finding all of that from the perichoretic relationships of God. Is that fair, or is he reading his own understanding of society necessarily into the life of God? There's many more questions we could ask here, but Moltmann is well reading on his own, and the Trinity and the Kingdom is a great place to get started in his work.